Yeah, so today we're going to talk about Rocket. And um, but first, let's talk about me. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, my name's Chris Kuhl. Um, even though I have the umlauts, I'm actually not German. I'm American. Uh, my wife is going to be those. Um, and so, I'm a managing director and software engineer at Kinfolk. Uh, we do um, we work with CoreOS to develop a rocket, and we work with a company called Endless Mobile, which some of you may know, which uses the GNOME technologies to make um, affordable um, computers for the developing world. And so, but nowadays I find myself doing more of the managing and directing part, and hence the second line, which says I'm one of the less active rocket developers. Um, some of the others on our team are very active, and of course, a lot of the um, CoreOS rocket developers are in Berlin now too. So. So what a lot of people don't know is that actually a lot of the rocket developments happen here in Berlin. Um, I'm also a former GNOME maintainer, so if you open up the GNOME system monitor, you'll probably see my name in the about box. Um, yeah, that's how kind of I got started with open source stuff. Uh, so before we get to talking about rocket, I would like to plug one project we're working on, and that is System Decomp. It's happening here in Berlin. It's going to be the second annual one. It's, uh, it's right before LinuxCon, um, September 28th to October 1st. We're having four days. The first day is going to be um, workshops. And then the uh, second and third day are going to be presentations. And then the fourth day is going to be a hack fest. So if you're interested in System D, uh, you may be a user now, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and, uh, but you should probably want to learn, you know, it'd be good to learn more about it, and uh, you can do that there. And it's in Berlin, so not far to go. Uh, so back to the talk. So we're going to talk about Rocket. We're going to this is this talk is very introductory, and we'll actually talk about actually why even containers. Um, so this is going to be true for a Docker or a Rocket, um, and then we're going to move on, and I'm actually going to demonstrate some very um, basic Rocket usage, and um, and we'll leave the more advanced stuff uh, for the next talk. Okay, so this is where we're going to go. We're going to explain containers. We're going to talk about Rocket, uh, what Rocket is. And then we're going to say, you know, why would you use it and what makes it unique? Because that's actually one of the, the most important parts of Rocket. Why it actually exists is because it does do things um, a bit differently than um, Docker, for example. Um, and then we're going to look at the demo part, which is how you use it. So, why containers? So you want to be able to run things in. Actually, how many people use containers already? Okay, just playing around, or is it in production? How many people in production? Okay, and uh, how many of those are you Docker users? So it's pretty much all of those. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. We have fertile grounds here. Um, so yeah, you want to. So you already know that you want to run your application in a term, deterministic manner. Um, and so this is how you start out on Linux. Uh, this is just kernel. You don't have anything. It's not the GNU Linux. It's the Linux Linux. Uh, then you add the GNU part and some other stuff, and you have a graphical representation of your system here. It's got some jagged edges. It's going to be, um, you're going to install something on it. This is your application. You're going to install it. It's going to fit perfectly. Great. Uh, this is the whole, uh, it runs for me, uh, or it works for me. But then you have a second distribution. You install some different packages on it. And you can see here, um, this profile, or the skyline, as you may, um, is a bit different, and so, and this is this is a grounds for potential problems with running your applications. Um, so here's the differences we have in these. And so when you try to run your application on the other installation, it sometimes doesn't work. There could be all kinds of uh, reasons why uh, this is the case, and we'll actually talk about that. Oh yeah. So I wanted to say, yeah, you can fix this really easily. Right? You can go in, you can install the right packages, um, make sure everything's running all right. Um, but you really don't want to do that when you're running lots and lots of machines. And so that's where this um, deterministic means of running your application is uh, rather important because we want to run a lot of these, a lot of instances of these. Um, and then we have the isolation part. Um, so your application thinks it's alone. It doesn't have to worry about what else is there. Um, so we're going to look at some of the problems here. So we have, um, when you're running multiple applications, you can run into a lot of different um, problems. Differences and conflicting runtime requirements. I think everybody has 
had the problem where you tried to install something, it requires a different library version of a library, uh, but hold on, you can't install that because then you have to get conflicts with another one. And uh, that other application you're running actually uh, needs that. And so this is uh, one of the situations that containers are really good for fixing. Um, and then you have the main ones are these, um, well, then you have the, um, the potential for colliding. Um, you may need, you know, ports or whatever. It can be all kinds of things, libraries, um, uh, dependencies. But then you have the security thing. Um, now, I think everybody's going to know that containers are not for security, but they can definitely can be a part of the security, um, the security, uh, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a component of your security, uh, what's the word I want to look for? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's not the uh, be all end all of security, but it's definitely an important part of it. Um, and so, because you have the things that these multiple applications see the same files, they have the kind of the view of the same network, um, they have access to other processes, other you know other users, um, and so this is of course um, potential problems. But a lot of people have said, I, th I think this is more what people said about a year and a half ago or something. Actually, it hasn't been that long, but it seems like a long time ago. People would say, no problem, I use VMs. Because then you get this isolation, you get this deterministic kind of uh, environment that you can run it in. And you know, people literally run one application in a single VM. Um, but VMs aren't, so yeah, VMs are good for that, but there's a lot of things that VMs bring with it. You have full virtual um, hardware virtualization. Um, this means you're emulating basically kernel. Um, and you, yeah, and so you want to, you have more resource use than you actually need to run the application. And so here's a, here's a um, diagram of this situation. So you have multiple instances of the Linux kernel running, one for each application, if you choose to run only one application inside of a, each VM. And then you have, of course, your distribution packages, you know, you would set these up with something like your configuration management or Puppet or Chef or whatever. Um, and this was working, absolutely. Um, but you can get this similar isolation, not full virtual, not full isolation, but it's a very similar isolation without the overhead of the VMs. And so when you're running the containers, what you have, you have the Linux kernel, and you can see the distro packages now are, are are very flat because to the container, they don't really care about that because they have their own internal dependencies that they um, are importing. Um, hopefully, these are very minimal dependencies. It's not like you know include Ubuntu and then everything is uh, you know 500 meg uh, container. Hopefully, we're past that point now. Um, but you you have the isolation, you have the dependencies that you need, and so you can run in a more or less deterministic. And so one of the questions is how actually do the containers get to this point? Um, how are they able to do this isolation? And there are Linux, um, there are Linux, um, Linux functionality that all container mechanisms use. Um, so Docker uses the same ones as Rocket um, and others, but they do it in slightly different ways and they might have um, you know, some trade-offs and so we can look down here. These are the five main um, technologies or functionality that the, um, that the Linux kernel provides that container technologies use. Namespaces, now this is for process visibility. Um, if you're running a process in a, a network namespace, for example, then that, um, that process only has the view of that network namespace. Um, if you're running in a mount namespace, namespace then it only has the view of the um, the amounts that it's uh, able to see. And so this is a way of, this is the visibility portion of it. And then you have C groups. C groups are good for managing or made for managing resources and limits. Um, and then you have things like setcomp. You can restrict functionality. You can say, you know, which um, system calls are not allowed to be um, called. Um, you have then capabilities. Capabilities are like um, permissions, basically. Um, it's not. It's not actually, um, the Linux kernel had, uh, the people developing that for the Linux kernel had higher hopes for than what they actually got out of it now, um, but it still has some uses. And then you have OverlayFS. Um, it's actually called Overlay now, that's why it's got the 
DFS is marked out. And this is for, um, you have basically a, um, a two layer or a multi layer um, file system. You have the immutable layer, and then you have the writable layer um, that your app can write to that you can persist. Okay, and then what containers actually provide are these images. Um, this is a distributable package, basically, for apps. Um, and we're actually going to look at building an image, and we're going to look at actually how that's constructed. Um, we're actually going to build an ACI. Um, so it's very similar to building a Docker file, um, but slightly different, and we're going to actually show that and actually what the end image is made up of. And here we go. So a container, um, a container application, containerized application, is basically a compressed tarball. It includes a manifest, and then you have a root file system. Um, in the example we're going to be showing, there's actually only two files. There's the manifest itself, this describing the, the image, and then there's going to be the root file system, which will only have a static binary. And we're going to show a demonstration with a, um, with a, a simple web server written in Go. Um, so the containers images are quite uh, nice. Uh, they're, you know, you can package your apps and its dependencies and, and ship those around. Um, you can make it easily be created. We're, we're going to use AC Build to do this. Um, many of you have used Docker files. And by the way, I want to make it very clear Rocket can run Docker images. So if you've invested a lot of time in creating Docker images, it should be able to run no problem. Um, and we'll actually show, um, I think it's etcd is what we're going to show running. And that's a, actually, it's the etcd one. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's not a good example. <laughs> um, and then we're going to. And then you can share your application. You can upload it to your server. You can put some metadata in your own web server, and you can actually then fetch that down. Um, and they can be signed and verified, uh, so that you you can ensure that you're running the actual application that you think you're running, and there's uh, been no compromise there. So that's the basis for containers. We want to talk now about what Rocket is. So um, I think. This is kind of the standard tagline. It's a modern, secure, composable container runtime. We can actually break this down a little bit. Uh, modern means it uses modern technologies. It kind of has to if it's a container technology, so that's a good thing. Um, it's secure. So Rocket is secure by default, um, and we'll demonstrate that. Um, it's composable. You can actually swap it out. And I was talking about VMs um, earlier. Uh, you can actually run your application as a container application, <coughs> application, or run it as a container, or you can run it actually as, with the hardware virtualization using KVM, um, and it's super easy to do, um, and you don't really need to do any more um, work to do it. And it's a container runtime. So, uh, but it's also the name of the command line tool that we're going to be using to run the containers. Okay, so what makes it unique? Or how a rocket differs from Docker, uh, since that's what most of you have experience with. So this is one of the most important parts of it. When you run a Docker, um, when you run a Docker image, it actually runs under that process. This is very important. This, this is the diagram on the documentation for Rocket. Um, I don't know how many people can see that. Uh, I'll get up here. Watch that. I guess I can. Um, on the left, you have, um, on, on all these systems, we're assuming that you're running system D, which is your init system. So that's going to have, that's going to be the parent of the parent of, of every process. Um, and so when you run Rocket, what you're doing, you're starting Rocket, the, the application container, directly. Um, when you're running, and then system D has full control over that and has full integration with it. Um, system D, um, I'm sorry, Docker. However, when you run the Docker run, it actually sends an API call to the Docker engine, and then that is in charge of running it. So you have this layer between the init system, whose actually job it is to run, uh, you know, processes and manage them. Um, and so you have a you have a process manager under your process manager, and if your Docker engine daemon uh, dies, then all your containers come down. In the Rocket model, if the uh, if system D goes down, uh, then your application will die. However, you have a lot of other problems if that happens. Um, so, yeah. Now, I what I was just referring to is actually 
um, Docker, one, Docker one, um, before 1.11. If you are now using 1.11 or better, actually I think it's still 1.11, right? Um, then when you run Docker, it actually sends an API call to another daemon, or I'm sorry, when you run Docker run, it sends an API call to the Docker engine, and then the Docker engine sends an API call to container D, um, which runs then um, a, calls run C, which is an application, which it runs directly, no API call there, and then the application is in charge of setting up the uh, container and then running it. Um, so this is actually, um, so one of the, uh, so that, that actually deals with one of the, um, the nits that people had with the Docker engine is that it was very complex and you're running your applications um, with your containers with something that's actually accessing the internet and everything. And with this, um, this breaking this container D part out, that actually doesn't have access to the internet. Um, and so you, only the Docker image does. And so it's doing less, so that's a good thing. However, you still have this layer where if um, container D crashes, um, then all your applications go down. But of course, now there's less uh, surface area. Right. What's that? Okay. Um, so with one of the things that you know people with Docker, Docker is designed to run one application, um, and you have to use something like Docker Compose, or you have to have some kind of uh, you know, supervisor D inside of your container to run multiple applications. Um, only with Rocket, you're actually, it's actually designed to run pods. So each time you run an application, it runs in a pod, and uh, and so you the pod and is is um, the, in the pod. So when you run a, when you run an application only one application, then you're running a pod with a single application. But um, you can easily uh, run multiple applications in a pod and it's designed for that. Because inside of a rocket container, um, container you actually have system D. So sometimes you're running system D inside of system D, and system D is really good at multi managing multiple applications. Um, it's secure by default, so you explicitly have to opt out of everything. Um, and we're gonna be doing that in our demo, if I can get to it. Uh, it's composable, I mentioned that a second ago. You can swap out the runtime environment, and uh, that's part of this one here. You can easily run apps with hardware virtualization, KVM. You can also run applications without any virtualization, and that's called Rocketfly, and that's sometimes um, good to do because you have your, you can use the packaging mechanism for, um, image, for container images, um, but sometimes you need to run um, a privileged application. Um, outside of all the container restrictions. There's other things. Okay, so now we're going to get to the demo. I have a bit of a problem here, but I think we figured it out. Um, is that kind of okay? Let me change it to uh, uh, light over white or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see, this one. Better? Yeah, that's better. People like that better. Okay, so um, the first thing we're going to look at is the web app. Um, I'm just going to cap this. How many people are familiar with Go? Okay, do you actually write Go for your job? Yeah, okay. I sound probably use this quite a bit. Um, yeah, so Rocket's written Go, Docker's written Go, so it's, uh, yeah the go-to language for this, I think. Um, okay, so what you have here, you have a very simple, you have your imports, and then you have the next thing is a function. That's the function that's gonna be um, basically writing our web page. Uh, it's just this hello rocket user. And then down here we have our main, which just listens on port 990. Um, yeah, so I've already built that, so I don't have any, oops, okay, I built that already. So we're gonna run that outside of the container, so we can actually see that it actually works. Uh, that that actually works, right? But we want to get that to work inside of the container. So we're going to shut that down. And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually, oops. Um, yeah, so I have a script here 
It is called Build ACI, and we'll walk through this. This is very um, similar to a to a, um, a Docker file. However, the key difference here is that we have it's basically um, commands that are being called, and so you can just put this in a bash script or whatever kind of script you want to write. Um, and so you'll see at the top, uh, after all the bash, bashy stuff, we have AC build um, begin. Uh, you can ignore the debug stuff. I just put that there. I'll put useful information in case of problems. Um, and so AC build begin. It sets up the environment to start building the application. And actually, the environment is simply uh, you have like a dot file, basically. It just creates an empty dot file with current ACI, um, which we'll look at in a second. And then you have a AC debug set name. You're setting the name of the of the uh, application. You're then copying over the binary that we just created. It's a static binary, so we don't have to copy any, over anything else. Um, we're just copying in the root directory. Um, we're setting it to be the default exec um, application. And then we're um, setting up the port so that it's actually listening on 990. And then we're writing the ACI, and then I have commented out the end because if we if we don't comment that out, we can't look at the inside of the, the build directory, the directory that's being used for all the building. Um, so we want to run this. Hey, what do you know? So I think what we can do 
if we go back up here, oh, but hold on, it's not going to be there. We need to do a, uh, I have to do this whole user local thing because I kind of screwed up my uh, stuff right before doing this, but yeah, it'll work like this. Uh, All right, so what you, you got rocket list. Um, so, and you'll see here you have a network. And so if we go back over here, we can replace the local host with this guy. And we can see that it's actually working. So, that's good. Uh, so yeah, we're running an ACI image on rocket. Um, seems to work all right. Uh, we can run something else though. Actually, I did one of those. It's a big special combination. Um, actually, this is kind of interesting right here. You see this whole, this line right here? This is actually the, uh, this is actually the name that is used. This is, it's, so when you run a, um, a rocket container, it gets registered with the uh, machine control, which is a, journal, um, a system D component. Um, for managing images and things like um, containers. And so we can actually watch that. Yeah. yeah, so if we do machine control, we'll see that we have this registered with this, um, you know, this is, this doesn't understand. Oops. Uh, well, we can use this for, but I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, okay, so now journal D, journal or journal control will show you the logs, but you can actually get the logs for the specific um, the specific uh, containers that are running. As you can see here, um, we're running our simple web server. Uh, we didn't do anything extra to set that up. We, when you run Rocket, it has integration with um, the system D running on your host, uh, which is quite nice, especially for the journal stuff. Um, okay, let me get out of this. I think I have about four minutes. How much time I have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So I have to pick and choose here. Well, I, I got through most of that, but I do want to show you actually how do you distribute images with Rocket. Um, so this is our, uh, so this is just our simple, this is our website. Um, and what we do, we host a sample here for the documentation, and it's under ACI. And but you only see a web page. Uh, but if we do, if we look at the, the the actual source of the web page, you have this meta tag. It's called AC Discovery. Um, and so you're not sending this up to some registry. You're just putting it into. You can you know set up an easy script that generates this automatically, and you can just um, pull these down. You can see there's some. Uh, Substitution here for the versions and stuff, um, but yeah, this is uh, you know you don't have to go through the whole hassle of uh, setting up a registry inside of your um, inside of your uh, um, infrastructure. Um, okay, so I don't have really much time, so I think we can probably just uh, so I did most of that. I think yeah, I did. I, I did most of it. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, so there's some other things coming. We have open container image support. That's being worked on, of course. There's Quite a bit of work to do there for that, um, but you know the nice thing about the container source, there will hopefully be a, a single image, and you don't have to worry about uh, Docker or ACI. It's just hopefully the OCI um, that you can use in the, in the future. Um, Full-fledged rocket support for Kubernetes is uh, being worked on intensively um, by the CoreOS guys, and uh, we have a new stage. You know, there's possibilities for adding new stage of one images. You know, QMU. You can even do OSX and Microsoft with quite a bit of work and around the edges, but uh, there was actually a pull request for the QGNU stuff. Um, IPv6 support in CNI. CNI is the networking plugin, and, um, and I'll be demonstrating that a little bit more next time. Um, and the per app set comp settings. Um, so right now it's like you the runtime sets it, um, but you can't really um, um, set your own. And so there'll be per app uh, settings for that too. So more restriction, more security. And there's a lot more. You can go to issues. Uh, yeah, that's it for now. Thanks. Does Docker depend 
on system D. I no no. Not at all. And, and actually, Rocket, um, you can run Rocket without have running on the system with um, system D. Uh, but the default um, the stage one image, which is basically sets up the runtime environment, that does use system D. Um, but you can run it on a system without it. Although there's not really that, much, that many systems left without it. So. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. Um, as I understand, you run system D inside the containers to manage the processes. Yes. Um, how do you, or can you, like run shell, like ex exec shells inside that container? Um, yeah. Uh, I'm, actually, I'm going to call up Iago, my colleague here, because he can answer anything about the system D stuff. Uh, so, um, what do you mean by shells? So, like for example, you have a running container, and you want to like run a bash shell uh, oh. inside the container. Yeah, so there's a thing called rocket enter, and if, if your container has a shell inside, you can just uh, run it, like a, the shell binary. Yeah, that's actually... And if not, there's ways to do it, but it's a bit more complicated. So basically, enter uh, enters the namespaces of the container, and then executes whatever you want. It could be a shell, it could be a uh, diagnostic command, or whatever. That's through system D. Sorry? That's with system D, or is that just another process running? No, that, that's uh, with, in, in, on the host, you can have anything. It will have the system D inside a container, but that you shouldn't be concerned about that. So you, you can just run it. And one quick question, does it take both loop devices and it runs the... Uh, Sorry, can you repeat that? Does it take both the loop devices? Docker kind of takes both loop zero, dev loop zero and dev loop one. And if you want to go and like, mount a, Back device, you mm -hmm. have to either add more new devices or shut down the docker team. Um, so we don't need, we don't have a device mapper uh, storage driver, so we don't take any loop devices. If that was your question, right. or was it your question if you could use it inside? No, no, that's exactly right. Uh, okay, that's, we, we just have the, the regular copy, uh, the image, and overlay that support for now. I have a question that you mentioned that the rocket got system D in containers and Docker it got both it got both system D and additional daemon. What's the reason for the Docker to have this additional daemon? Or they or they, they don't use the functionality of system D, they use it just to start the, to, to, to start this daemon. Um, so, so what's the reason for the Docker to want this additional de demand? What benefits do, does it give to them? Okay, um, he's asking about, um, I think we are asking about like the dependencies of Docker as a system D kind of, and why does it? So in this diagram actually, Docker has nothing to do with system D except that it's a process on a system uh, that has system D as its init system. Um, and so, we're, what we're saying with Rocket is that when you execute it, then System D is responsible for running that. Um, with Docker, um, they have a, an, another daemon that actually manages the containers that it's running, and so you have this additional layer. Now that has some um, some advantages. For example, like if you're running on OS X, you have this uh, what is it, boot to Docker or something. And since uh, we only have an API call uh, that you're making, you can easily do this uh, to the you know the boot to Docker VM and everything is then running inside the VM as far as the, the container management. Uh, it's a little, that'd be a little harder to implement with Rocket. But, yeah, is that right? Yeah. Okay, thanks.